perfect. I can see you, Rana Balash. How are you? Hey, Krishna. Yeah, nice speaking to you. Perfect, perfect. So, Abhilash, we just started with a quick introduction on what we are going to cover today. And uh, I think it's a quite interesting topic, something that you have been advocating for very long uh, as a part of Privacy APN. And of course, uh, you understand this topic better than most people in the country. So, I think you are the best candidate to also share your knowledge around what exactly is differential privacy and how can organizations benefit uh, it. Uh, benefit from it as well, right? Before that, I would just pass it over to you, Abhilash, if you can give a quick introduction about yourself and your role and how exactly do you intend to uh, push privacy from a technology perspective. Over to you, Abhilash. Hey, thank you, Krishna. Thank you for uh, having me on the call. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so we are a company called Privacy APN. We are a privacy enhancing and responsible AI technology company. We enable organizations in meeting um, you know, global privacy regulatory requirements with privacy enhancing and responsible AI technologies. So we have a spectrum of technologies um, in terms of uh, privacy. For example, you know we have a product called Differential Insight, which is in line with uh, differential privacy requirements. Um, there are there is a product called Event Horizon for anonymization, for privacy text modeling, or a product called Privacy X-ray. Um, so, and for responsible AI, we have a product called Private GPT. So, we have a spectrum of products which are organizations for meeting the requirements. So, primarily, we are a research centric organization focusing on privacy research. There is a lot of background noise that uh, from there's a lot of I echo. Uh, I hope it's not from mind. I'll just mute myself. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think, yeah. It's better now. So, yeah. So, we, we work on um, these. Uh, privacy enhancing technologies and we enable organizations to meet this requirement. That's what we do in privacy. Um, you know, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, I, I would not claim the most, uh, you know, knowledgeable person. Probably there are a lot of professors out there who are like, probably, uh, you know, have deeper understanding on DP. But yeah, we are trying our best to ensure that, you know, these are implementable at the end of the day on ground. And we are building products to ensure that, you know, these meet, um, the the regulatory obligations thus people can unlock data so but certainly thank you so much for your kind words perfect thank you abhilash and i think the table of contents that we have for today is we are going to start with an introduction to an ist and differential privacy uh, then i would transfer it to abhilash who would help you understand the properties of a differential privacy and how exactly it is translated in the real practical scenario how can you use it as a, a global organization or how can you use it as an Indian organization wanting to take your product global? Both of those perspectives are something that we're going to touch upon. And then, of course, we are going to talk about the implementation challenges that if it's a technology that's so advanced, that's so well and, you know, pushing privacy forward, why has it not been implemented so far? What are some challenges that you would typically see in your organization or the challenges that you would typically see implement implementing it across the globe? So that's what we uh, that's what we are going to talk about. and. When it comes to NIST or differential privacy, we basically want to convey that NIST, of course, is an organization from the US which has been promoting a lot of standards around information security, data privacy, as well as certain other technological domains. Now, when it comes to a cybersecurity framework or a privacy management framework, NIST has been one of the uh, frontiers in terms of advancement of the frameworks. And a lot of organizations take reference from it a lot of organizations learn from it and try to imbibe the principles of privacy through nist as well now when it comes to ensuring uh, data privacy through differential privacy what you can showcase to your customers as well as uh, as well as your organizations is to ensure certain areas such as the integrity uh, making sure that the products that are developed follows the core principles of data privacy which are, of course, data minimization, data storage limits, integrity, and confidentiality. So these are the core principles that the NIST framework, of course, is also based on. Now, in terms of differential privacy, Abhilash, I would transfer it to you. If you can help our attendees understand from a laymanish perspective of how would you explain differential privacy to people, right? How do you exactly convey it to non-technological folks or individuals who are just starting to pick up these core technology or privacy innovations? Absolutely. A very, very important question, Krishna. Um, so I would say that, let us say there are, um, you know, uh, students in a class. Uh, there are 50 students in a class. 
and the average of these 50 students average mark uh, is 70 right now a new student joins the class um, now the average of the class is still 70 right there is no publication of any information about the new students individual marks but because one you know th this this only you know x plus one and then uh, even after this adding this student score the average is still 70 discloses this student's uh, mark is 70 right so that's the fundamental principle of differential privacy which means that when there are two data sets which are change different by only one attribute and even then um you know the the inference um you ensure like it protects privacy at the same time it protects utility to the best possible effort how do you achieve that is what it tries to do so the solution to in a, in a laymanish way what we can say is it always adds some error to the average answer and gives the answer that way you don't exactly know who's what was this person's score and you cannot it may be higher or lower but you give you get a perspective of what is the average of the class without the possibility of knowing what is even if the delta between two points is like one person uh, where there is a possibility of singling out attack that is not possible and um, you know um, you you get to know the answer in terms of utility but you cannot re-identify the person in terms of a singling out attack or other things in an ongoing database and this is a very very common problem across businesses because people keep getting added or keep getting removed from databases uh, right for example let's say covid database um, your neighbor visited um, and then took covid test in a specific center let's say dr lalpath labs and then they keep publishing the information of candidates without just masking their names and uh, you know um, their their ids they just publish all of the information it becomes very easy to re-identify you know whether you are your neighbor who when you know that there is some background knowledge that you have of he probably visited the uh, the the test center yesterday and you want to know his results probably if this information is published you can easily identify whether uh, you know this guy if, let's say if it has address information or age information or gender information a combination of those probably you can identify okay you know all this information of your um, you know neighbor and you can re-identify that okay your neighbor has covid or not and this can extend to anything else. It can be extended to salary. It can be extended to multiple other things, which becomes very problematic. So uh, when you are collecting sensitive information, let us say salary, or when you are collecting other information, uh, hence it becomes very, very critical. You use methods like you know differential privacy while you are collecting because you don't know when a breach will happen. Um, so how do you process the data? How do you store the data? How do you share the data? becomes very critical and data publication is not going to be there for long anymore so it's going to be like differentially private where you add errors or you do aggregation or you do synthetic data on top of it and then share data and differential privacy is a philosophy than a technology where this can be applied in different areas um, not just in a you know a, in a, 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 a simple um scenario that we looked at like you know average of a class but this can be applied to a you know stochastic gradient descent of a model where if a model is like uh, you know converging you apply to it and then its learnings may may be slightly different but it will still be the same which can help protect against privacy similarly it can be applicable to federated learning where you are collecting information to from end devices for example mobile phones google is using google keyboard where keyboard is integrated into all applications you are using and they can see whatever you are typing right now which is a huge privacy risk now you can apply they they do differential privacy on top of it and then try to learn things which are you know appropriate while protecting your privacy they still learn but you know while protecting your privacy so things like those um so it's a very very important concept and it is one of the very mathematical ways of solving this problem 
uh, which is acceptable by regulators across the globe as well. So Abhilash, I think uh, there's also a very common question that people typically ask, right? It comes to us when we are implementing privacy programs that can it be done manually or do we really need a tool? Right. So how would you respond to that? I mean, of course, it also makes sense that the amount of personal data that flows into or is ingested into a company's infrastructure, it will be very difficult to do it manually. So what is your opinion on that? And how do you think it can be automated or probably be assisted by using a tool or a platform? See, this is like a very, very complex mathematical problem. Um, right, you know, defining an epsilon, defining a delta, defining a, you know, a, a, a what mechanism do you want to use? A, you know, a, a Laplace mechanism or a Gaussian mechanism, and um, uh, what releases you should do? What is your privacy budget? How do you track the budget? Um, it's very, very complex. Like I would recommend, I won't recommend anybody doing this manually, right? Um, uh, and with a large volume of data, it becomes much more complex. So you require a tool. The, the problem is there is no single silver bullet for different. Differential privacy is a philosophy. It's not a definitive technology, uh, right? It's not a not a package or a SDK. You say, okay, I am putting differential privacy for this. Like now everything is differentially private, right? Um, it, it, depending upon the data release or information release or knowledge sharing um, depending upon the context the type of query and type of usage of the data type of release of information the the way you will have to structure this changes this is like cyber security mathematical level on data so this is like very very different so depending upon the scenario you will have to um, you know build um, tools so there is no single tool which will solve all your differential privacy needs. It has to be context specific. For example, um, you know, for example, GAN, we had something called DP GAN. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, for uh, querying, you can have different kind of DP. Um, for model building, you can have different kind of, uh, you know, differential privacy, the way you implement it into the model training part. Um, or at the inference level, you can have DP in a different way. So it's a very, very, you know, different kind of technology. And um, it, it's a philosophy, I would say it is closer to philosophy than a product or a you know package, uh, right? So um, I would say differentially private what? Differentially private inference, differentially private querying, differentially private, you know, what, right? Differentially private synthetic data. So depending upon that, it would decide what, knowledge you need to have, what mechanisms you need to have, what techniques you need to have, what products you need to have to achieve that objective. It is like uh, differential privacy is like travel, right? So uh, uh, you can go from here to Chennai or here to, you know, Los Angeles. Um, you may have different modes of travel. You can, you can go by ship, you can go by, uh, you know, flight, um, uh, um, you know, you can go by, a, you know, a jet. So there may be different means and then, uh, you know, all of them are travel, but different techniques are applied in achieving this. So differential privacy is a philosophy of, you know, sharing data with mathematical guarantees. But how do you achieve that is like problem centric for different problems. You have to do it in different ways. Right. So I think uh, with respect to that, because we've spoken about how uh, we particularly have to add some noise into the data set to also make sure that the kind of inference that you typically take from personal databases or the kind of personal data attributes that you're looking at from a functional level, those inferences cannot be made. And at the same time, the utility of that data is preserved for your business teams, your product teams, and your engineering teams as well. Now, I think from a global percep perception, uh, we have the US, European Union, as well as China using it to some context. And you will see, as Abhilash also mentioned, uh, a great example like Google and IBM that are working on these noise adding mechanisms. And at the same time, it is also helping their business teams, you know, perform their daily business activities. Now, uh, looking at what the research says, there's a lot of supervisory authorities that are also starting to talk about PETs or privacy enhancing technologies. So differential privacy, the concept or the philosophy would definitely fall under one of those domains as well under PETs. 
right? And of course, in China as well, you would see Huawei as well as the State Grid Corporation and Baidu, which is a very common, a very famous platform in China, using certain differential privacy concepts and assisting European countries on a European project lazy to ensure the legal and ethical restrictions. So in terms of the development and in terms of the start of using this concept, it has started in the developed nations. And in India, this is something that is being picked up from uh, by various organizations, Ablaj being a representative of one of those organizations as well, who are driving this particular technology for organizations in India looking to go global or looking to protect global citizens data and also comply with global data privacy laws. Of course, it also helps you comply with the DPDPA as well. Now, Abhilash, uh, a fantastic concept, a fantastic theory, but why do you think it has not been implemented so far? What are some challenges that you see or hear from your customers? And what are some pushbacks that you typically would receive from the customer perspective? Yeah, so the challenge in terms of adoption is awareness to start with, right? Uh, or even before that enforcement, somebody will say, nobody is being penalized. Why should I get into so much of complexity while sharing data, right? When when the regulations come, we'll see, right? The, the rules are not out, we'll see what happens. Um, or I'm sharing data, um, my business team may not be able to share, um, you know, uh, analytics team if, we are not sharing data then what will happen to them if you are adding so this is so the first level is awareness right awareness and um and the need the the need is not pressing at this point it become pressing when couple of people are penalized right few million dollars are uh, applied as penalty in india probably you know people will the big techs are doing it because they have enough pressure from multiple sources right they have to go to congressional hearings and then tell what what efforts they are taking to meet it so they have enough pressure so you you need that because your utility is going down right so you need incentive to like give up utility for certain things and they will not see that value till the time you cannot touch this dpo let's say dpo becomes powerful right and then say you cannot touch data only give enough privacy guarantees can be shared data, which is what regulation is saying, but people are signing it off for various reasons, right? But when that happens, um, it, it becomes, uh, and it's a two-way street, right? Um, businesses don't know how well it'll work. It's sort of a chicken and egg problem. There is nobody to be blamed here. It's like, uh, and uh, you know, my professor used to say a very interesting thing from IM Bangalore. Um, there is this, uh, he calls chicken and egg problem, the penguin problem, where Penguins after hibernation will stand in a queue and uh, uh, there is a competition who will first jump because there may be sharks lurk water. But at the same time, there may be fishes as well. So you don't know. So it uh, so the most hungry penguin will jump first. Right. And then others will jump and then it will happen. So same with anything that we see in business as well. Right. Um, uh, uh, businesses will see the most hungry ones who want to be strategic in nature who want to create value for businesses the right way who want to build the new business models the right way will jump first they will take the advantage they will take the risk as well of you know sharks being there but they will definitely catch the you know richest of fishes in the blue ocean so this balance has to be struck and uh, you know this is what this is this is classical how platforms get built how adoptions happen how network effect kicks in so we are going to see all this play out um, in the market, but this is the answer to the adoption, right? Network effect kicks in when the early movers are there, early movers set the uh, example, and then it is followed by the early majority, late majority, and then laggards will follow. Right, and Ablash, I think in terms of the other PETs or other, other concepts that are typically around or the keywords that are floated around in the industry, uh, in terms of a technology integration perspective, how do you foresee and what teams do you feel would be a critical part of enforcing it in an organization? Would it be primarily the technology team or do you also see a lot of other business uh, support functions such as maybe the engineering or the technology team or the product team assisting you with the implementation or the uh, you know drilling down of concepts in their business processes? So how has the adoption been so far and who are the teams that are typically taking up this responsibility from your perspective? Yeah, sure. So uh, typically um, the, the, 
there is there is there is uh, innovation teams which come in followed by legal teams data governance teams so it's a decision making unit right for example this goes not just for data this goes for ai as well so typically model building is one of those pressures which are pushing organizations in this direction where they have to you know share data but there is no consent if we build model it will result in problems um so uh, how do you expose models uh, data to model building exercises without consent this is one of the biggest challenges that organizations are facing where data release becomes very critical so business units typically the way it gets played out is like you have a specific use case where business teams want delivery at certain point of time but the legal team say we cannot give data because of these reasons and then um, the 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 technical teams um, are asked to come up with solutions and then the technical teams for example data governance teams look at like okay how do we solve this problem you know which is uh, bring it reduce the level of risk to such an extent that legal team may give sign off um, or the dpo team will give a sign off and for that you require technical safeguards which is required for example dpdp that is the highest penalty 8.4 8.5 clauses directly speak about technical measures and organizational measures uh, without which uh, without doing that if there is a breach you will be penalized to 50 crore so that is very very obvious so organizations are beginning to see what are the technical safeguards to be put in place and that comes up with a swarm of technologies and as we discussed these are like different um, you know technologies as well not just differential privacy there is there are things like uh, you know k anonymity t closeness there are things like synthetic data there are things like um, you know federated learning on the on the statistical side of things then on the cryptographic side of things you have confidential compute homomorphic encryption um and then you have secure multi party compute so these are technologies because you, with with the regulations if the regulations are actually implemented by the spirit of the regulation people can't touch data beyond consent most of the scenarios unless there is a legal grounding right which is like some law enforcement is asking for data and all but today nobody has so much of consent now then how do you take data how do you run business else businesses will freeze that's where pets come in and these will be adopted for sure uh, this is the core of you know that's where even if you look at uh, us executive order of safe secure trustworthy ai pet takes a very important position in the whole uh, guideline so for model building and for data sharing for data even touching data for any of these perspectives pet are going to be very critical and the adoption is slow today but everybody starting from oecd to you know icvo uk to saudi arabia government to you know nist to um, you know singapore government to indian government to everybody is speaking about pet right probably in a years time you will see crazy amount of adoption but early movers are already taking it. early movers are already early movers critical organizations who are having large volume of data especially who are in sensitive industry verticals like finance healthcare um e-commerce where buying behavior or their um things like those or children's data is involved where penalties are high it can be very stringent um and organizations which give premium to users um you know feel of premium uh in in terms of their services they are the ones who are you know looking uh to implement pet technologies right i think a lot of technology companies uh, it service providers that are providing services to all of these developed nations or economies and of course the governments are also pushing it in certain cases that also sets the context for why it would be a viable concept to push forward in the future and with that uh, abilash i think i'll just open the floor for q and a as well so if there are any questions uh, we have the next few minutes to answer your questions so you can simply just put your question in the comment section and we'll take it up either abilash or me depending on the domain and the subject uh, so if you have any questions at all you can reach out uh, via the comment section and we'll take it up if not uh, we will just you know wait for a couple of minutes and if there are no questions you can reach out to abilash as well on linkedin he is a pioneer in this domain and there's also a great certification that uh, the privacy pn team has been working on around uh, these concepts so if you are interested of course you can go and check it out as well uh, because i am personally going for it as well as i discussed with abilash over the last few months is if it's something that interests you and you're looking to also uh, build your data privacy uh, concepts and build more awareness around data privacy it's definitely a certification to consider as well right so then the next few minutes are for the attendees if you have any questions please feel free to ask us
it. I so, hope we have not scared the attendees by all the technologies we have discussed, Abhilash, and all the concepts. Uh, yeah, please go on. You were saying something. Yeah, interestingly, we were at uh, uh, it was at NIST uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, in US in their uh, Maryland headquarters. We had some good conversation with some of them. Um, so uh, certainly, this area is emerging very, very rapidly. Um, they also have published some guidelines on um, you know differential privacy specifically. Um, you know the paper is called Guideline for Evaluating Differential Privacy Guarantees. Um, so people, if there are people who are interested in this, they can have a look at that as well. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, uh, we have a you know uh, privacy uh, certification program as well, which is primarily for privacy enhancing responsibility technologies. Would love to you know if people are interested, they can drop a message. We'll be more than happy to connect with them and then um, you know see take it forward. Um, so looking forward, and yeah, any questions will be more than happy to take it, or you know they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, and then, of course, they would know you. So uh, that's also a channel. Definitely. Thank you so much, Abhilash. And thank you for joining in and sharing your insights. Uh, this is something that has been a lot of talks around privacy enhancing technologies. But it's mostly something that has been untouched uh, when we look at the actual implementation side. Not a lot of organizations are doing it. But more of the organizations that have considered it as a strategic initiative, they are certainly considering it and probably moving advanced in uh, that space as well. So thank you for sharing all the information. And you can reach out to Abhilash or me if you want to talk about something more around the same grounds. We are happy to assist. And with this, we'll close this webinar. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your time today. And thanks, Abhilash, especially. Thanks, Krishna. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you, for everyone, for joining this session and you know, uh, for the interview. Thank you, sir. Great. Have a great week. Bye-bye.